Good evening and welcome to a special Pi Day edition of Monday Night Calculus. Thanks, Allison. Uh, this is Curtis Brown, your host. That was Allison Steele. Thank you so much, Allison, for kicking us off this evening. Um, as you may be able to tell, I am uh, not on video this evening. I am uh, on vacation, hanging out, uh, celebrating Pi Day with my family in eastern Oklahoma. So really excited to be joining you all from there. Um, again, I just really appreciate Steve and Tom. Thank you guys for joining us this evening and uh, offering up your uh, expertise. Um, and I guess I'll let you take it away. But uh, before I do that, I want to just remind everyone, uh, we will be checking the chat. Um, so put your uh, questions and things in there. Let us know where you're joining from. And uh, also, uh, we'll be watching the chat. Um, and for uh, folks who are particularly uh, ambitious in answering questions, asking questions in the chat, and we see you on there a lot. We will be selecting a person uh, at random from the chat to um, have Steve and or Tom uh, teach a, a uh, one-hour uh, class in, uh, for your students. Uh, we'll have them do that remotely. Uh, we actually have someone, uh, I believe uh, Stephen Beck, uh, who won uh, the last month's uh, drawing, and um, we are having his uh, class here in a couple of weeks and really excited to do that. And uh, We did another one another uh, couple of weeks before that, and it was really great. The students responded well, so hopefully you'll stick around for the end. You must be present to win, and we will select you and have you uh, send us some email, and we'll set that all up. Steve, take it away. All righty. Thank you very much, Curtis. How's that? I can't ask you, but Tom, screen okay? Yes, looks great. Okay, thank you very much. Well, indeed, it is Pi Day. It's wonderful to be with all of you. You know, I looked this up today. I, I think it's actually also Albert Einstein's birthday today. How about that? I didn't get any cake, but I, I think it is indeed his birthday. So we have some cool problems tonight, Curtis. Uh, some Problems with just a little bit different twists in them. They're good AP calculus problems. And uh, let, let's see what we can do. Good chances for technology, too. So let's start out with number one here, which is a particle motion problem. We have this particle moving along the x-axis, and the position is given by this expression for x of t. Now, what really, in my mind at least, makes this kind of unique is this expression for x of t actually involves uh, an integral expression. So it actually involves something a little bit different. It's not a polynomial. It doesn't have trig in there or an exponential or log function, but it's got this function in there defined in terms of a definite integral. And that's a little bit different. And that's one of the reasons I thought this would be a good one to take a look at. So in part A, we're asked to find both the position and the velocity of the particle when t is equal to three. Well, the first part of this isn't too bad. Uh, to find the position, we just need to find x of 3. So we're going to go back up here and we're going to plug in t equal 3 into that expression. So the first part of this is really just a polynomial. That's pretty easy. And the second part of this, well, is a definite integral. And that's not a bad antiderivative. It's just s cubed divided by 3. And so we evaluate that polynomial piece and we evaluate this antiderivative piece. Whoops, I'm sorry about that. And we end up, I think, with a minus six. Looks a little bit odd maybe for the position, but that's okay. Uh, the position of the particle could indeed be a negative value if you picture this moving along the x-axis and maybe moving back and forth. So that's okay. Now we're asked to find the velocity at time t equal three. Well, let me just sneak back up here for a second. We know that the velocity is the derivative of that position function. So we can pretty easily, I think, here take the derivative of this polynomial piece. How do you take the derivative of this piece? Well, that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. And I'm just going to add a little bit more in on the end here. We're actually using the FTC to get this piece. And so the velocity function ends up being pretty easy, it actually ends up being a polynomial, a quadratic, in fact. And we can evaluate that at t equal three. And I think I did that correctly, 
Tom checks me very carefully on these, and I think we got a minus eight here. One thing I'll add off to the side, in this problem that I took from the Facebook page, uh, there were no units given here, but if you're gonna use this problem in your class tomorrow, that's another thing that you might think about, adding some units in here, adding a little bit more to the statement of the problem so that you might ask for the units associated with the velocity. Okay, cool. At time t equal three, what's the speed of the particle? And then is the speed increasing or decreasing at that time? And give a reason for your answer. Well, let's see. We know that the speed is the absolute value of the velocity. And we already have V of three up here. So it's just the absolute value of minus eight or just plain old eight. So there's the speed of the particle at time t equal three. And what do we need to do here to decide whether or not the speed is increasing or decreasing? Well, very typical AP calculus question. We need to examine both the acceleration and the velocity at time t equal three, and we need to compare those signs. So let's see. We already have the velocity at three, that's minus eight. We've got to find the acceleration. Well, the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward here. I'm going to circle something up here again. The velocity we have is a quadratic or a polynomial. We take the derivative of that expression, term by term. And then we can find a of three pretty easily, and there it is, minus two. And so let's take a peek here. The signs are both negative. The signs are the same. And so remember to write something on the AP exam, write a conclusion here. Since the velocity and the acceleration have the same sign, the particle is speeding up at time t equal three. Tom, don't let me misspeak, misspeak here, but I wanted to mention something about these problems on the AP exam. <clears throat> you know, frequently in these problems, we get a question like this, is the particle speeding up? Is the speed of the particle increasing or decreasing at a particular time. And in order to answer that question, again, we have to take a look at the signs here, but we don't have to report the exact values of the velocity and the acceleration. And just a word of caution to your students, if they do indeed report these values, they have to be correct. And if this is a calculator active pro problem and you're gonna report this to three decimal places, then don't it, they have to be correct to those three decimal places. So a test taking strategy here is to not report the value, but to simply say, oh, you know, this is less than zero and that's less than zero. Of course, unless these values are asked for, but if they're not explicitly asked for, remember you don't have to provide those values. Cool. So there's more to this one. In the open interval zero to four, we're told that the particle changes direction exactly once. Find the value of T where this change of direction occurs. Well, okay. So in order to do this, I have to take the derivative of the position function. I have that up there, that's the velocity. And I have to find places where the derivative is zero or does not exist. Now I left a little bit out here. I'm gonna write off to the side, you know, ordinarily I'd also check where the derivative or where the velocity does not exist. But look, this is a polynomial. There are no places where the derivative does not exist. And I understand that always sounds kind of funny, but in order to be complete, I'm gonna add that off to the right hand side. So I'm gonna find the velocity function. I'm gonna factor completely. This one factors kind of nicely. I've got two zeros here t equal one and t equal seven, I'm gonna cross out the seven because we're only interested in this interval, zero to four. And darn it, I'm gonna draw a sign chart. For those of you who have been following along with Monday Night Calculus, who have heard at least me talk about this before, I'm still a big advocate for sign charts. Now they're not sufficient on the AP exam, I get that, but I'm still a big advocate for this. I think this is wonderful notation. And all we have to do on the AP exam is interpret what we have in this sign chart. So at least in my weird way of doing things here, I'm only interested on in the interval zero to four. I put in some closed brackets there. I'm interested in what's going on in between. 
I have one place where the velocity is zero. I put in tick mark there at one, the velocity is zero there. And now I have to figure out the sign of the velocity in those two intervals. Now I know everyone has a different way of doing this. For me, I sort of argue in general. I take a look at this completely factored form and I say, well, okay, what happens if I take a value less than one? If I take a value less than one, this expression is, whoops, I'm sorry, this expression, oh boy, I didn't like that one. Sorry about that, Curtis. Oh, you can't see that anyway. Let's try this. There we go. If I take a value of, of t that's less than one, this expression is negative. This one's negative also, and I multiply and I get a positive value. If I cross over one, then this expression becomes positive and I multiply and I get a negative value. So that means the velocity is positive on this first interval, negative on that second interval from one to four. So I know that the position of the particle, I know that it's moving to the right over here, it's moving to the left over here. So I need to write something here. I'm gonna put a little asterisk. I need to interpret my sign chart the particle changes direction at t equal one because the velocity changes sign from positive to negative at that time. So again, for emphasis here, sign charts are a wonderful tool, I think, but I still need to interpret that sign chart on the AP exam. And there's more, there's a part D here. So what is the value of t for which the particle is farthest to the right and farthest to the left? Now, it doesn't say so in part D, but my interpretation of this when I read it on the Facebook page was that we do wanna look at this interval zero to four. So I'm gonna approach this one from the candidates test. And I think that's one of the safest, most prescriptive ways to do this on the AP exam. As we get closer and closer and you start to do some review, so I have to take a look at the endpoints here, zero and four. I have to take a look at where the velocity is zero. That's at one. So I'm finding the position of the particle at each of those points, or pardon me, at each of those time values. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these evaluations with you. They're not that bad. Uh, again, uh, the position function, remember, has a definite integral in it, so that's okay. I've got a position of zero. 10 thirds and minus 44 over three. I've sort of summarized all of that in, a, in a, my table over here. And when is the particle farthest to the left? Well, this is the smallest value. That position says I'm farthest to the left when T is equal to four. This is the largest value. The particle is farthest to the right when T is equal to one. I'm going to show you a couple of graphical ways to, to take a peek at this and to sort of confirm what I found analytically. What I did was I plotted t versus x, the position here. So t is on the horizontal axis, x is on the vertical axis. So as t increases, I can see the position of this particle. And in fact, that t equal one, you can kind of see that it does reach this maximum value, positive value, farthest to the right. And at t equal four, I'm down here. Whoops, I'm sorry, I'm down here. Close to a t equal minus 15, I'm farthest to the left. And here's another way I like to interpret this graphically. The particle starts out at t equals zero at zero on this horizontal axis. It starts moving to the right. At t equal one, it turns around starts moving to the left and ends over here at t equal four. So that's a really, I think that's a nice problem. It's got an extra sort of twist in it. I think if you're gonna do this one with your students, you might add in a little bit more. I'd like to suggest that another way to make this just a little bit more complicated is to increase or change this interval a little bit, maybe make that say zero to 10, something like that then students would have to also evaluate this position function, I think at x equals seven. So that might make it a little bit more interesting. Cool, Tom, do you have any technology on this one or should I take a look at number two? Uh, yeah, Steve, I thought I might uh, just do a quick bit with the technology because uh, okay. 
you know, I think the one advantage that the technology lends to this, you had you had produced a couple of nice graphs, but okay. uh, because it's actually parametric motion, we yes. can actually see the motion dynamically if we're using technology. So I just cool. wanted to kind of review that quickly with folks. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share my TI-84 screen. Okay. And you can uh, give Got me it. some feedback if it's showing up okay. Got it. All right, great. Uh, so if we're gonna take a look at this, we're uh, gonna need to change our graphing mode uh, to uh, parametric. And so uh, probably 90% of the time you're on function, but uh, doing parametric will make that change here. So we've got parametric now. And when I go to the Y equals menu, you can see that I've already uh, entered in exactly that expression uh, for, in this case, it's X1 T, uh, right. complete with that integral. And sometimes people aren't aware that you can definitely do an integral based function uh, on the uh, TI machines. Now here's something I just point out, I think I've pointed this out before. If I'm looking at horizontal motion right, uh, along the X axis, technically Y1 T should just be equal to zero. But I, I've arbitrarily made it equal to one just to lift it up off the axis just so I can see it better. That, that's the, but I'm, I need to remember that it really is along the X axis. And now let's get our window set up. Um, and let's see, I think it was from zero to four was the time interval. I went ahead and did those. And then a T step I've set at 0 0.1. That's gonna be the increment for T. And let me change my uh, window a little bit. I think this, from what you said, it looked like it went almost to negative 15. So I'm gonna yes, take yep. my, uh, just short of negative 15 maybe, negative 15 and uh, let's go with five. And then uh, YMN, YMAX, uh, I'll leave those alone. I think those are fine. Let's take a look at a graph. Boom, there it is. And you saw a little bit of motion there as it was graphing, but not much because it just <laughs> went too fast, right? Uh, and that's where I think the trace comes in so nicely here. So I'm gonna turn on the trace and there we're starting out at, you can see T equals zero, X is starting out at zero. And then if I hit my right arrow key, just at kind of a constant bing, 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 that's actually gonna give me a sense of the motion. And I wanna include if, I, if I'm incrementing at a pretty constant rate of T, I'm going to get a sense of whether the thing is speeding up or slowing down too. And that's kind of cool, given one of the questions that you looked at. So I'm incrementing. We should see it turn around at t equal one. Yeah, there we went. It was like three and a third. I think you found ten thirds. Yep. And then t equals three. Yeah, I think you get a sense it's jumping faster and faster to the left. And so that's that speeding up. It was both moving to the left and increasing in speed, going faster to the left. So that uh, was where we saw, and then there, there's this negative 14 and two thirds. That was where we ended up with a T equal four. So we can see our left and right most points. And it's just, I think uh, the technology is just a fantastic tool, especially for something dynamic like motion. So. All right, I'm well, going before to- you, Before you leave sure. this one, I have a quick question for you. So in, in the past, you and I, you've looked at some expressions, graphing some expressions that involve a definite integral as the definition of a function. And, and many of those actually, it took some time. I think we might've done one the last time, it took some time. So do you have any sense as to why this one is so fast? Um. I mean, certainly you know, I, this, this is numerical, so it's not finding a, a symbolic antiderivative. Right. I think it's simply because it's um, it's simple enough function, but it is doing it numerically. So it's not like right. internally figuring out, oh, that's S cubed over three, really. Uh, right, right. Which, and th this particular one, uh, I, I forget whether you mentioned <laughs> that actually resolved, you, you know, you could just went ahead and got a kind of a closed form without an integral right. involved at all if you wanted to. Uh, but this one, I think it's just, it, it behaves so nicely that it's able to compute those pretty quickly. 
So could it have anything to do with the fact that this is a quadratic and maybe the technology in the background is using Simpson's rule? It could be. I'm not sure that it uses exactly Simpson's rule, but it probably uses something that converges so quickly, quickly for, yeah. for simple polynomials that it's taking advantage. That's, that's a really good observation. If it was actually using Simpson's rule, yeah, it'd be super fast because yeah. it should be getting an exact answer with a very coarse participant. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's cool. Very cool. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Steve. I might need a little help with, uh, let's see, new share. Let's see. No, I don't want to do a new share. I just want to, you can rest control away from me. That <laughs> so, All right, I will do my do best here. All right, great. Hang Perfect. On. Thanks. All right, hang on. Let's see if I can do that. Whoop. For some reason, my uh, uh, stop sharing button is not visible when I do this. So, Okay. Uh, well, I don't know where my Zoom went here. Hang on a second. There we go. Whoops. Oh, boy. I don't know where. Oh, there we go. Hang on. Nope. Hey, I'm sorry, Tom. I don't know where my, my Zoom stuff went. It's gone. Let's see. Hang on one second. I'm getting there. Okay. My bad, I think. I um, like that I went a little clumsy in stopping the sharing. Let's see. Okay. So, whoops. You can't see my screen. Is that correct? Tom? Correct. We can't see your screen, Steve. Sorry. Yeah, I can't see it yet. All right. Hang on. Allison, is there some way you can uh, you can pass the share to me? So Tom is no longer sharing. I've I no one is sharing anymore. So you should be able to just grab it and share your screen. I would like to do that, but I can. <laughs> okay. Let's. See. Nope, I don't know what happened there. I lost my Zoom window, although I'm still on Zoom. I seem to have lost my Zoom window. Nope. Let me try this. All right. Did not do anything? Yes, it says you are the host now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you have share screen at the bottom, Steve? How about now? Nope. Hey, Steve, can you get your task? Can you get to your task bar? Yes. Or see if you can get to your task bar and click on the little Zoom icon. Yeah, but it's not. Nothing's coming up except uh, log into Zoom, which is bizarre. That is strange. Uh, do one other thing for me then. Sure. Uh, press uh, press and hold alternate, All right. and then tab, and then hit the tab key while you're holding alternate down, and you should be able to find a Zoom window, uh, like a, a dashboard. Let's You'll see a set of icons pop up. Yep. Boy, you, you find that Zoom dashboard. Nope. Apologize, everyone. We have a few technical difficulties here. We'll get it sorted out. Ah, deeply sorry. No Zoom dashboard there at all. Well, I'll tell you what. You want me to log back in for a second? Yeah, do that. Uh, right. Tom, you have uh, question number two in front of you, don't you? Uh, I do. Um, I'll need to open you it have up. Some technology and... you can show uh, and kind of take us through while Steve is uh, logging out and back in. Maybe you can introduce sure. the problem and uh, and take it from there. Uh, sure. I think. Um, yeah. Let me fire it up. So you go ahead and yeah, go ahead and share your screen and just kind of. If you can show that that part that uh, PDF and kind of kick us off for problem two, and um, and we'll uh, 
we'll make it run from there. Okay. All right. Give me just a moment here and I'll get. Uh... See if this. Okay. Can you see my uh, All right. screen here? We yeah. Can. So this is. Uh, so this is the uh, number two, uh, and this is. Uh, What's that? And Steve, feel free if you want to talk through this while I'm going. Sure, I'll be happy to. Okay. All right, hang on. You can One direct second. me to scroll if you need to. All right. How about I, I'll take I'll, I'll share my screen now. Would that be all right? Oh, okay. Yeah. If you've got control sure. back, go ahead. Okay. Whoop! I cannot share while the other is sharing. So if you'll let. Oh me. yeah. All right. Let me. And give it a shot. There we go. All right, looks good. Try that. Hey, how's that? Fantastic. Great. Sorry, Fantastic. Eric, what happened there? But there we go. And I'm gonna Glad make you back, Steve. Just a fuzz bigger if I can. There we go. All right. So I like this problem too, Curtis, because it involves a table of values, and it also, in my opinion, makes students really think about problem solving. Um, Tom knows this is one of my big things is, is how do you teach problem solving? And it's very difficult in my opinion, but this is a cool problem. So this table below gives some values of this differentiable function f and its derivative at some values of x. And we're given some information here. We know that this definite integral is equal to 14 and we're asked to find this one. And I, you know, I often think about some students come into my office and, and I know this has happened to Tom, you know, they'll come in and they'll say, hey, would you help me with problem number 47? And I'll say, well, okay, how did you start? And they'll say, I didn't know how to start. I don't even know what to do. How do you problem solve? So what do you do to solve this problem? And here's a couple of things that you might think about. Um, two important aspects, I think, of problem solving are, well, look, you want to use the information that's given to you. So somehow I want to use this circled information. That seems important. Somehow I want to use what's in that table. But I also think about pattern recognition, and I try to get something, get this problem back to something that I know about. And, and this expression here is kind of screaming out at me, integration by parts. I see this x times, it's not a transcendental function, but I see this f prime of x and it's saying, oh, integration by parts, because I, I can find a nice antiderivative of that f prime. So I'm gonna try integration by parts on that. I'm gonna let u be equal to x, and why is that a good choice? Because when we find du, we've gotten rid of that power of x and all we have left over is that differential dx. DV, it's what's left over inside here. That's the F prime of X DX. And we can find a nice antiderivative of that. That's just F of X. So here we go with integration by parts. This would be equal to U times V. U times V minus the integral of V. Wait a minute, what's DU? Oh yeah, DU is just that DX. Now, I often get asked this question too, Curtis, at this point, you know, what's the sort of notation do you use for this on the AP exam? And this is kind of a form of notation that I use. You'll notice that I have everything bracketed and I have a two and a five there on the end. I think that's okay. That's certainly understandable. But then in this next step, I realize, well, hey, wait a minute. I think I can evaluate this expression and this is the definite integral that I was given in the problem. So this again is a very nice question because in order to evaluate this, I'm gonna to have to go to the table to find these two values. And I did that, I put everything together. I did a little bit of simplification and I think I ended up with a 13. This is a great problem to try tomorrow morning in class as you're reviewing here. A tabular problem, integration by parts, good problem solving skills. Tom, I don't think there was anything on technology here. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, Steve. I, there was one comment I might make, though, if you can scroll back up to your table. Yes. Um, so 
you know, we talk about uh, approximations a lot in calculus and, and uh, yes, yep. uh, for example, a tangent line approximation to a function. And then later on in the, in the BC calculus, you, you look at Taylor polynomial approximations. Yes. And students might have, uh, you know, they look like curve fitting like regression or uh, interpolation where you're just trying to find a, a curve that goes through points. Uh, another kind of function approximation is a spline, and you've got exactly the information that uh, people use to make what are called cubic splines. So the, 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 uh, the task is, is could you find a cubic function f of x that uh, is at, is, has value four at x equal two and slope seven, excuse me, slope two at x equal two, and then it has value seven at x equal five and slope three at x equal five. So you're kind of given both the, the uh, function value and the slope value at two points. And the trick is, can you find a cubic that does that? Now, in this particular case, you've got a different, you've got an additional uh, piece of information that uh, a cubic won't necessarily fit. And that's that integral value. Uh, yes. But but I would say that would be a kind of a different twist one to do with this table is ask students to find uh, such a function. All right, back to you. Very cool, very cool. All right, Curtis, we've got another differential equation problem. This is a kind of cool one. And I apologize for this, but I'm gonna actually answer some questions that weren't asked in this problem because just because I thought it was really cool. So we have the slope field for this differential equation. You'll notice that there are no x's on the right-hand side there, but here's the slope field, and I believe that's correct. And I think the original problem, a uh, question, excuse me, on the Facebook page from Nancy Smith was this one. If y equal g of x is a solution to this differential equation with this initial condition, then find a limit as x goes to infinity of g of x. Now, now look, we're gonna get back to this, but I think, I believe the way I believe what this was asking students to do is to sketch the solution curve on this slope field that goes through this point, minus two, minus one, and using that sketch, determine what this limit is. I think that's what it was asking the student to do. But there's just so much other good stuff going on here. We've got to take a look at it. So here's a naive way to think about this. I looked at this and I said, well, you know what would be really cool? It'd be kind of neat if I could actually find this function g of x and then evaluate the limit rather than just kind of crudely look at the slope field. So I tried to do that. So I could certainly separate the variables. And here's a question for the chat, Allison, because I know you need some business over there. I've separated the variables and I can certainly find an antiderivative on the right-hand side, but how do you find an antiderivative on the left-hand side? How do you do that? I think our AP calculus students can do this. 50 points for the first person who answers that. How do you do that? Yeah, how do you find an antiderivative on the left-hand side? Hmm. How do you do that? What's the technique? You don't have to tell me what the answer is. I can't tell just by looking at it. But what's the technique that we would use in order to find an antiderivative there? Allison, anything in the chat on that one? What's the technique that we would use? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, no. They might be thinking. They might, they be, might thinking be thinking still. about that. Okay. All right. Well, we'll take that. Well, it turns out that the way to find an antiderivative on the left-hand side here is with partial fractions. Oh, and just before you said that, Wanda Burns chatted in saying partial fractions. Way to go, Wanda. Very good. Excellent. And she you was know, in before you said it. I'll give her credit. <laughs> Touche. Okay. Well, this 50 is a very, points, Wanda. This You're is in a, the lead. 50 points. This is a reasonable partial fraction problem because um, the denominator there is a product of linear factors, one of them raised to the second power, but it's a product of linear factors. So just kind of quickly looking at this with partial fractions, this y squared term, if I can do this, this y squared term contributes two terms to what I call the PFD, or the partial fraction decomposition. 
And each of these terms contributes one term to the partial fraction decomposition. So that's what it looks like. Now, now let me back up just a second here. I'm not getting to the antiderivative yet. I'm just going to rewrite this circled expression using partial fractions. So what do you do now? In general, what we do is we find a common denominator on the right-hand side, which is the product, which is this, and then we equate numerators. So in the interest of time, I did a little bit of that. I collect some terms. And what this leads to is an expression on the left in y, it doesn't look like it, but it is, and an expression on the right in terms of y. And if we have two polynomials that are equal, their coefficients must be the same. So this leads us to a system of four equations and four unknowns. Yikes. In general, that's the way that we solve these. Now, those of you who have been teaching AP Calc know that we often have some sneaky ways that we can do this, especially with linear factors. You know, we can let y be equal to one of the zeros, let y be equal to another zero, and we may be able to find some of these constants very quickly. But in general, we have to solve a system of equations. So I did that. And here are my values for these constants a, b, and c. You'll notice here that a turns out to be zero. So that means that this term is not in the PFD, is not in the partial fraction decomposition. Interesting. So let me take all that information and go back to the differential equation. Here it is. So in this expression right here, all I did was I, whoops, I'm sorry. All I did was I used the partial fraction decomposition right there. And now I've got to integrate both sides. Well, the right-hand side is pretty easy. The left-hand side, well, okay, let's see. This is just going to be the power rule to get that, this first one. The next one, well, it's going to be a log, but there's got to be an extra minus sign in there, right? There's actually a small substitution in there. Actually, a substitution in this one, too. But almost integration by inspection is what I like to say. And so when I solve these differential equations at this point, as soon as I find the antiderivative of both sides, I like to use the initial condition. So I did that. I plugged in, let's see, it would be a, an x equal to minus 2 and a y equal to minus 1. So I noticed that what's inside these absolute values, those arguments are positive. So that means I'm on a branch here where those arguments are positive. So I don't need the absolute values here. I solved for c. Yikes, that's crummy looking, but that's the exact value. And here I am. Now, remember, the reason that I did all of this was, first of all, because it was a very cool antiderivative. But I also thought initially that I would be able to solve for y in terms of x, and then I'd be able to take a look at that limit. But boy, as I stare at that expression, I don't think I can solve that for y. I don't think I can get y all alone on one side of the equation. <laughs> so I'm kind of stuck here. I'm going to go back to my slope field and see if I can get some answers there. Well, we were told that this solution curve goes through the point minus 2, minus 1. And what I tried to do was to draw in the solution curve following the slope field. And I got it looking something like this. If you can see that, I'm going to try to trace over there. And I do not believe that it crosses over the x-axis. And in fact, by looking at the solution curve, I believe the following is true. I believe that the limit as x goes to infinity of g of x is equal to zero. Now, there's some subtleties in here, and Tom and I have talked a little bit about this. There are some subtleties here, some analytical arguments that we may be able to make here to convince ourselves that indeed this limit is zero. Um, I'm just going to mention one, and then Tom may, may talk about another here. You know, if x is increasing without bound over here on this side, that means the left-hand side must be increasing without bound. I can see here following the slope field that 
y is getting closer and closer to zero through negative values. And therefore I can argue what these two things, these two expressions are doing. They're getting closer and closer to log two. So they're gonna kind of cancel out. And so in order for this side to go to increase without bound, this must be getting smaller and smaller negative, getting closer and closer to the zero through negative values so that this whole expression will dominate the left-hand side and therefore increase without bound. Now that's a pretty loose argument based on that expression. Um, another issue here for me, for us is, well, how do we know for sure that the solution curve does not cross the x-axis? How do we know that it does not cross down here this line y equal minus two? Well, for me, that has to do with looking at this expression over here. I can't have y equals zero because then the left-hand side would not be defined. I can't have y equal minus two because then the left-hand side would not be defined. So I feel pretty comfortable that that's what the solution curve looks like. Tom, did you wanna talk about another way to look at this limit? Uh, no, not really, Steve. Okay. I think you did a fantastic job. All right, thank you. All right, anything on technology here, Tom? Uh, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, All right. I'm going to give this stop share and another shot. Here we go. Okay. All right. I'm going to actually shift over to the uh, TI Inspire. Okay. And um, good. Got it. Uh, just, you know, this is a TI Inspire cast. And certainly, uh, it's not expected that everyone's going to have a CAS machine on the on the AP exam. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you're going to be expected to solve a differential equation on the AP exam, it's very likely you're going to be on the non-calculator part of the exam, anyway. Yep. So, but I did want to show. I think for doing differential equations and maybe checking solutions and things, having a differential equation solver is kind of neat. So I just wanted to kind of illustrate that with the Inspire, uh, the CAS version. So I'm going to bring up the uh, uh, menu here and actually insert uh, math box. And what I'm going to put in there is uh, actually a differential equation solver. So I'm going to go down to my calculations. And let's go down to calculus. That's what we're all about. And let's see, we got down here. Let me go down, keep going down. Ah, there we go. I kind of overshot it. So let me go up. There we go. Differential equation solver. Okay. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, wow. We actually get this uh, uh, kind of a, a box to uh, fill in. And let's see, I think our differential equation was y prime equals y squared times four minus y squared. Right. And independent variable and dependent variable are independent variables x and a dependent variable is y and conditions. Oh, that's where we could put in an initial condition. Uh, so I think our initial condition was y of negative two was equal to negative one. I hope it didn't get that backwards. I think that's, that's right. perfect. Perfect. Okay, let's hit okay and see what happens here. Okay, that just filled in the box. And now when I uh, hit um, enter, we'll see uh, what it comes up with. Wow. Now, that's you know, that cool. doesn't look absolutely identical to what you came up with, Steve, but if you Kind of look through it, it, it makes sense. That absolute, you yeah. had a two minus y. Well, that y minus two absolute value would be two minus y for yeah. y negative, right? Yep. So, okay. Yep. Uh, and I think you ended up with a 36 over, well, there was a 36 inside parentheses and a 16. Well, this two here is going to take care of a big piece of that. You'll see the four here. Yes. Two is 32 over 16. 
another four over 16. That's where that 36 was coming. From. Gotcha. Pretty cool. So it actually did it symbolically yeah. and it didn't come up with an explicit function. Interestingly, it, it is, it's got this, uh, why is in several terms here. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't able to isolate. So it might've been coming to the same conclusion you did was maybe there isn't, uh, a, a single, maybe this is the best we can do. Uh, let me go ahead and um, go to the next page. Let's see a graph of this. Uh, for that, let me go to uh, graph entry edit. So what is this kind of graph, Tom? The function y is a function of x? Uh, no, we're actually going to do a, a slope field. Slope field, okay. Yeah, so the differential equation plotter is actually a slope field plot. So... Okay. Enter that. Now here it says y1 prime. And so we got to remember that when we refer to y, the function, we want to use y1. So it's going to be y1 squared uh, times 4 minus y1 squared. Mm -hmm. And our initial condition, we can put that in there. Uh, let's see, that was like negative 2. Right. Oops, Whoops. Negative two, and then positive, oh, why? Negative two, negative one, I believe. Yep, perfect. I'm just going to go over here, edit parameters, uh, solution method, that looks good. Uh, field resolution. This is gonna be pretty coarse. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna actually ramp that up quite a bit to make it a much finer slope field. I'm gonna multiply by four. Let's try 56, I'll press OK, and boom, there's our slope wow. field, and uh, it's actually plotted in a solution curve um, using an approximation method. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it looks, I think, very similar to the curve you came up with. Uh, but I wondered what it would look like if we plotted the relation that we had there that it came up with on top of the slope field. So I'm gonna go back to the menu, graph entry edit, and actually uh, go to relation because we don't have an explicit function here. Right. And I think I went ahead and rather than type this all in from scratch, you can see I've copied over what we had from the uh, math box. Okay. And so now I'm going to uh, check this. And now this is a graph of the relation. Hmm. Part of it's covered up by the solution here okay. that, you, that was done numerically, but we had this other piece. And in fact, I'm gonna claim that there's probably two other pieces here. There's a piece that's coming down to a horizontal asymptote from above x, uh, y equals two. And there's another one, you're not seeing it level out because it oh, levels yeah. out so quickly. Uh, but there's pieces of three solutions, but I think as you pointed out before, we really need a continuous function if right. we're looking for a solution to a differential equation. So this relation, it's not the graph of a function, but a piece of it would, we, I think we could think of this as a function of X, that, that part that actually satisfies the initial condition. So again, uh, you know, I think this question would be most likely on a non-calculator part of the exam. Uh, but uh, uh, if you have a CAS or, or uh, the slope differential equation plotter is really a numerical tool that's going to be available on on machine like the, the TI Inspire even the non-CAS. All right. We have uh, a question from the chat. Sure. Um, really quickly, what is the interval that can be used for field resolution? I too like higher numbers. Well, I think you can put in any number. Uh, the default's 14. And I don't know off the top of my head what that's referring to. If you use the, the default, it, you, you get a slope field, but they're, they're big, huge line segments, and there's only a few of them on the, the screen. So I, I tend to do things like this, where I put in a lot more, a higher resolution. I, and I, because the default, it, the default's 14, I've tended to go with a multiple of 14, uh, but I don't, I'm not sure that that, that matters. So. But yeah, the higher the number, the finer 
the uh, lattice of slope segments you'll get. And Tom, is it true that the higher the number of the uh, calculator automatically adjusts the length of those segments? Absolutely, yeah, is yeah. That correct? So it's going to put ones that fit and and leave a little bit of space between gotcha. them horizontally and vertically, so that gotcha. uh, you have a better chance to visualize. Them. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, All right. Very good. I'll stop there and turn it back over to you. Okay. Let's see. All right, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Here we go. Hey, this seems to be working. Um, Curtis and Allison, if it's okay with you, since we're getting close to the end of the night here, the end of the evening, I'm gonna skip to number five. We'll of course provide this and you'll post it on the website, but I think this is a nice AP calculus problem. Also, this is a calculator active question. Um, and there's a couple of, I think of important test taking strategies here. So let's consider this one. Um, we're going to let R be the region in the first quadrant that's bounded by the y-axis and the graphs of these two functions, x squared plus 1 and 5 minus e to the x. The first thing I want to do is find the area of the region R. So I've graphed these two functions here. Now, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find this point over here where these two graphs intersect. So we're going to have to find that value. Now, remember, this is a calculator active problem we're assuming. So remember that you have to uh, write down in the free response portion, you have to write down the mathematical expression that you're using or solving or plugging into your calculator. So I'm solving this expression and I get a value of about X equal 1.058. Now remember, uh, in a case like this, I'm going to store this value to the highest degree of accuracy allowed by the machine but I will write it down on my exam paper to three decimal places to the, or three places to the right of the decimal. Now, I didn't know whether or not I would need this, but I also found F of A. And remember, this is F of A, where A is uh, uh, very accurate, but I wrote it down here, three digits to the right of the decimal. So how do you find the area of this region R? Well, okay, classic sort of problem. It's the definite integral from zero to A. The left-hand bound here is zero. The right-hand bound is right here, A, a little bit bigger than one. Uh, y high minus Y low. The high curve is five minus E to the X. The low curve is X squared plus one. Now, look, if this is a technology act of problem, um, a couple of things. First of all, I can stop right there, go to my calculator and plug in. Second thing is um, in, a, in the free response portion, it is likely that these two functions will have names, like one of them will be F and one of them will be G. And we always recommend that you use the function name so that you reduce the chance of making any kind of a copy error. Now, I thought that I would simplify a little bit because, well, I thought I might be able to find a nice symbolic antiderivative and I can, and I could reach that point and then plug in zero and A if I wanted to. So either directly from here, or if I went a little bit further, I use technology to find a 1.957. Here's another classic piece of this. Find the volume of the solid results. When we take that region R and we ro rotate about the x-axis, here's the way that I like to do this. I've got a picture here, and what I'm going to draw is uh, I'm going to draw two lines from the outer curve to the axis of revolution, from the inner curve to the axis of revolution. Um, in my mind, those radii are perpendicular to the x-axis, and that tells me that this is going to be an integral with respect to x. It's going to be a dx on the end. The outer radius, I have to get an expression for this distance at an arbitrary point x. Well, that's just 5 minus e to the x minus 0. So there's r sub o squared minus r sub i squared. It's the same value of A here. Don't forget the pi out here. I go directly to my calculator to get an answer. This is 28.841. Great problems to start out tomorrow morning. Here's another one. Here's part C. Actually, this is probably a more than a nine point question, but here's part C. So there's a solid S that has base R. And each cross section that's perpendicular to the x-axis is a semicircle whose diameter lies in R. I've done my sort of best to draw one of these cross sections. So here's the diameter right here. And here's the semicircle that sort of comes up from the screen. I need to find the volume of that solid S. 
So I just want to remind you, I'm going to scribble a little bit off to the side here. The volume would be equal to zero, the definite integral from zero to a of a of x dx, where a of x is the cross-sectional area at an arbitrary point, whoops, I'm sorry, at an arbitrary point here x, okay? So we have to find that cross section at an arbitrary point X. So the first thing I thought about is, well, what's the diameter? The diameter is going to be five minus E to the X minus X squared plus one. I did a little simplification and I want the radius because I'm thinking about finding the area of that circle. So the radius is that diameter divided by two. There it is. Now there's lots of twos floating around. Tom, don't let me make a mistake on this one. So the area, the cross-sectional area is going to be pi r squared. That's the total area of that circle, but I only want half of it. It's a semicircle. That's why there's an extra one half in here. And finally, I go to my calculator for a 1.736. That's a really nice problem. You need to think very carefully about what that cross-sectional area is. And I've got a part D in here. We always see questions like this on the AP exam. I'm telling you that there is a vertical line X equal K that divides the region R into two regions of equal areas. Right, but don't solve, <laughs> but Tom may solve this, an equation involving one or more integral expressions that could be used to determine the value of K. Now look, this isn't the only equation especially in light of some of the answers that we have up above, but here is one. And that is that the integral from zero to K of Y high minus Y low has got to be equal to the integral from K to A of Y high minus Y low. That's certainly an expression or an equation that we could use in order to solve for K. We know what A is. And we may be able to plug into our technology. Tom, can you finish that off maybe and find that value of K? Sure, let's try it. Go ahead and give that a try. So, All right, go ahead. Terrific. All right, I'm going to uh, go back to the 84. Okay. And see if I can pull that up. All right, there we go. And, um, so this is a great problem, I think, to kind of illustrate best practices. This is a problem that would be very likely be on the calculator part of the exam. Uh, so um, going Agreed. to y Agreed. equals, you can see I've gone ahead and put in the two functions here as my y1 and y2. So let's go ahead and graph those. All right, it looks like very a cool. graph similar to what Steve had. Cool. And uh, let's see, we'd like to find that intersection point. Well, uh, we've got a uh, calculation menu that we can pull up right on the graphics screen. And we wanted to calculate, let's see, oh, number five there, intersection. Let's do that. And ask for a first curve. Well, that uh, upper curve will work just fine. And the second curve, okay. And the guess, well, Looks like we're pretty darn close to the intersection <laughs> point. I'm just going to hit enter. And there's this 1.058. Steve reported it the three decimal places, but you can see there's not the next two decimal places are zeros. But, yeah. um, but in general, if, uh, unless you're asked for that value, uh, if, if it's only a value you're going to use in further calculations, you want to go ahead and store this to all its accuracy that you can get. Uh, so you don't have some premature round off error. So I'm going to go to the, uh, notice that's labeled X. Yes. If I quit and go back to the calculator screen, if I just call up X, it's got that value in there. So let's go ahead and store that as A. And then I don't have to retype that in. Again, I can just refer to A, and also on your paper and pencil part of your exam, you could write A equals, write out all this accuracy, but then yeah. just from then on, refer to your value A, because you've declared what, what you mean by the letter A. So, very cool. Uh, Steve was asking about that, uh, solving that equation. Well, let's go to math. And let's see, I'm going to go... 
all the way down here. Let's see what we've got. Oh, a numeric solver. So we'll pull that up. And you can see uh, for one of my expressions, I've got zero decay, y1 minus y2, my upper curve minus my lower curve. Expression two, that's half of the area. That Another way to do it. Yeah. Very cool. So that's what we want to uh, solve. Uh, this OK button, that's actually referring to my upper right button up here. So let me go ahead and do that. And there's the value for K. Wow. Now, you could have written the uh, second expression, Steve, as K to A. Right. Like you had. But uh, I, I went ahead and took advantage of the fact you had already figured out the numerical value of the whole region. So I just took half of it. Yep. So... Well, Very actually, cool. it hasn't solved yet. Let me go ahead and do this. I think that I had solved earlier. Yeah. And it's telling me it's found a value that makes those, the difference of those two expressions zero. So wow. it was good. So it, it didn't balk at all at, at having to deal with that interval. So it's pretty powerful. Cool. And that's a numerical solver. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Okay. Thanks, We're probably close to the end here. Thank you, Tom. Curtis? All yours. Yeah. Still there. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I'm still here. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And uh, I'm sad I didn't get to uh, see it tonight, but I will, uh, I'll will have to go back and, and watch the video uh, later on, which reminds me that um, you can uh, go back, re uh, check out the recording of this uh, at the uh, TI website. We've posted the uh, link to the blog in the chat. Uh, there and then uh, I also just uh, I wanted to remind you that uh, we have available uh, if you've watched this live stream or if you watch this recording on demand later on uh, we have uh, available some PD certificates for one hour of, uh, of uh, professional learning so you can email me my email address will drop it in the chat uh, and or you can just uh, email me at Curtis at ti.com, C-U-R-T-I-S at ti.com. Uh, and uh, let me know that you would like a link to go get that certificate and I can, uh, I can set you up. Uh, lastly, we will be posting the presentation that Steve put up tonight uh, on the TI blog where you access uh, all of those uh, presentations and uh, the links to future sessions. Um, and again, Steve and Tom, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your patience with my uh, not being live streamed uh, tonight. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys here in just a little bit. Uh, hope everyone has some um, some pie this evening and uh, enjoy. The Do we have a winner? Friday. Do we have a winner, Curtis? <laughs> Uh, you know what we have uh, we're looking through the chat here and we'll uh, we'll select someone okay, good. Uh, to make good. sure that we get uh, get get in contact with them good okay great all right thanks Chris. So you guys uh, we'll sign off here and uh,